So I'm thrilled to be here this afternoon. It's, uh, we have a farm uh, uh, out east of Oshawa, uh, which is where I came in from today, and it's nice actually to be this close to home. So, oh, I'm not, is the camera okay? Yeah, because I'll move around just a little bit, and then I'll get to some notes. So this is very unusual for me because I, I don't do lectures. Um, I do presentations, but not in a lecture format. And uh, secondarily, I'm not used to being filmed, so I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> and then we're going to finish my presentation, and we're going to turn the camera off, and then you guys can have at me. So is that a deal? So, okay, so get ready to have at me because I like that kind of interaction and debate and I like actually to actually think as a collective about how we can improve uh, things that we do and have in Canada. And there's another reason that this is just sort of bizarre for me. What Peter asked me to present, and he heard me do this in Ottawa at a, at a similar event, I guess you could say, Peter, uh, is a report that we did. Past tense. I don't like us to think about past tense. I like to think about what we ought to be doing in the future, rather. Uh, there's another issue with this report, and that is that it's a year late coming out, and it was late to start with. So, so you're going to say, but Ken, we know this stuff. We know this stuff because the conference board has been doing it, public policy forums doing it, other groups have been actually talking about this. Globe and Mail had a beautiful series on innovation, talked about some of these same data points that we're using. We do this for a reason. So I do believe that we ought to be getting into the future world. But unless we actually benchmark where we've been and how we compare to others, it's impossible to know whether we're putting forward enough effort. And I'm going to demonstrate to you today that, frankly, we have not been. When I took over as chair of the Innovation Council, which was last July, this report was on the corner of my desk in draft form. It was already late. And I looked at it and said to my council, who are a very good group of people, it is an ecosystem of the Canadian economy. We have university presidents, we have academics, we have CEOs of companies on the council. 15 of us from across Canada in all. We are an ecosystem of Canada's economy. CEOs from the various components that you would expect if you were trying to draw together a group to actually drive innovation in this country. And I said, I do not believe that we can scold Canadians to improve. The report's rather negative that I'm going to go through this afternoon. I don't think we can scold Canadians to improve. I think, on the other hand, we need to encourage them to improve. So we reworked the report a bit. We didn't change any of the facts because, frankly, facts are facts. Can't change those. But we changed the tone a little bit to say, yes, there are areas where we are failing and there are areas that we are not keeping up. But if we work together, we can actually achieve greatness. And that's what I'm going to walk through this afternoon in about the next 40 minutes. And I am going to kind of stick to notes because I need to do that. So Stick was created in, in the year 2007, so it hasn't been around that long. And it was created as a result of three different federal advisory groups that were giving ministers advice. The problem is, because they were three different groups giving ministers advice in different areas, if we were in government, how long we would call them policy fields, right? Uh, the cabinet was getting different advice <laughs> that didn't always, wasn't always congruent. So the cabinet said, okay, let's create one group and have all that debate take place in a different room than ours. And that's why Stick was invented uh, in 2007 add to the mix that we had had in Canada a science advisor uh, up until or just before that time, and that function was kind of rolled in. I'm not the science advisor. I do not have a PhD. What I do in my life is convene groups like this to say, how do we work together to make things better? I'm not a scientist, right? 
And so that group was, was created, and one of the first things they did was say, well, we better have a benchmark on how we're actually doing, comparing ourselves to others around the world. And so the first State of the Nation report was printed. It was based in 2006, but it was printed in 2008. We compare ourselves then to reports that have been done 2008, 2010, 2012, 2014, which is the one that I'm actually presenting uh, to you today. And also taking into account, as I mentioned, uh, work that's going on by the OEDC. There's some people that don't like us talking about this uh, because it, it sounds negative. It sounds like we're not doing well in Canada, right? And, and I argue with those people, unless we actually have conversation about this, and find out that it's not just that we're not doing well, it's that others are doing extremely well and better than we are. And so if innovation matters to us as a country, then we better actually uh, change our method of operation so that we do a better job. Okay, so here I go now back into history that supports the point that I've just tried to make. I should mention that this report is for, it's, it's designed for policymakers for company leaders, for university leaders, for government uh, leaders. But I think we've missed the boat on that over the last 10 years because it's really for an engaged citizenry. Because it's the engaged citizenry that can actually change things for those three different groups that I've talked about, particularly the public official part, uh, because they actually count on our engagement. Okay, so I'm going to give the conclusions first. Then I'm going to talk about the conclusions, then I'm going to do the conclusions again, right? So that's, that's the sort of the format that we're going to do. So we concluded in this major piece of work, which was uh, 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 highlighted by a working group of our council, uh, including two university presidents and the, and the past chair, that, that Canada fell further behind its global competitors on key business innovation indicators. The, cap, the gap between Canada and the world top five performing countries widened. We got worse. Canada has a solid foundation in knowledge and talent. Some of you in this room, just because we happen to be on the University of Toronto campus, I assume, had worked at some point in your career in the academic world. That could be incorrect, but I assume some of you did. And so you would be interested to know that we have a solid foundation in the work that we did around knowledge and talent, but we can't be complacent. Canada maintained a solid performance on knowledge, quality indicators, but lost ground to competitors on investment in R&D. I'm going to explain that, because you get elected officials saying we spent more on research, and others saying we didn't spend more on research. I'm going to explain that, because it's fascinating how truth can be told differently <laughs> using the same data points. Canada's talent base continued to be an asset, although performance showed mild signs of erosion. So those were the general conclusions. And if you need to go now because it's a nice day out, you know, go, because you've just heard it, right? The rest is detail filling that in. So we actually studied this time with a lot of effort, sort of the business innovation key findings and how business was doing in Canada. And I can tell you that John Manley, who heads the, they've changed their name now from the CEO group to who can help me with that name. Uh, what, they've got a new name for the organization. John Manley challenged me on this, right? Well, the data is the data. I mean, I don't make it up, right? It's, it's based on OEDC and Stats Canada data, and, and frankly, that's why it's mature data, 2012, most of it, that we're using here, right? So you can argue that, well, for sure, we've changed in the last three years, Ken, and the data will show that three years from now. We need an innovative private sector to transform knowledge and uh, marketable products and processes that drive economic growth, high standards of living. We all know that, right? And one of the things that we did with this was conclude that Canada fell further behind its global competitors, particularly in relation to the world's top five performing countries. Well, how did we actually do that? How did we mine the data to do that? We came then into subcategories in the report. That's where you get it if you want it. I didn't bring copies because, frankly, uh, we used to print 5,000 and then we printed 3,000 and then we printed 1,000. And this time I said, look, just put it on the web, right? We, we can save all that paper. And if people are very interested in it, they will be able to look it up. 
So I didn't bring any copies with me today at all. So we looked at various components of that, and here are some of the data points, which I find interesting, and I hope you do. From 2007, think about that date, 2007 to 15, so we're looking at, what, eight-year period, right? Canada's business investment in R&D dropped by a billion dollars. You go, well, billion dollars, okay. Well, here's the other part of that, right, which ties into the same data point. In contrast, most other companies saw an increase in, in business investment in R&D. Thus, Canada's ranking on their, their uh, R&D intensity uh, fell from 18th to 26th in the world. So you start to get a picture, you go, what? I thought we were driving things here. No, we fell in a decade, eight years, from 2006, we were, uh, sorry, we were 18 in 2006, so we dropped to 26 in 2013. Now, some people say, yeah, but Ken, come on. That's because we're natural resource intense. And if you're natural resource intense, you don't need to do that same kind of research that other competing nations would need to do. So we mined that point, right? And we found out that, in fact, our natural resource-based companies are competing in R&D, particularly the oil and gas. And you're either a friend of oil and gas or you're not, right? But we all either drove a car or brought a subway here. So we better have some understanding of the importance of oil and gas. And that group actually competed very well internationally on the R&D front. So natural resources did okay, but we really did badly. Hmm. What didn't do okay then? Well... Maybe it's the small companies because they don't have money, enough money to keep up. We actually found out, oh, I'm ahead of my notes, that our small companies did very well. I'll get the data point here, but I just, I just moved. I, that, that's what happens when I go off script. Uh, so the, the small companies did very well. It's the mature companies that frankly don't do well at all. Canadian, mature, large cap companies that do not invest in R&D and not those that are in the natural resource sector. You think about it, oh, wait a minute, we're in Ontario today, aren't we? Oh, what do we do here? Oh, do we have big companies doing it? Oh, I wonder why our manufacturing sector isn't doing well. Well, perhaps it's because they're not competing internationally in R&D. I'm not saying they aren't. I'm saying the data is saying, hmm, somebody's not doing it. It's not the natural resource sector, and it's not small companies. Another thing that we look at is not just R&D. We say, well, wait a minute. In the modern world, if they're investing in ITC, uh, computing power, then that would be a surrogate for investing in new things that would help them be more productive. Well, how did we do then around that? Canada's ICT investment per worker was only 51% of the ICT investment per worker in the USA. You've got to be kidding. We invest, as Canadian companies, half per employee that our competitors in the USA invest in ITC. Oh, my. Are you getting discouraged yet? Well, then let's look at talent, because if we're not investing in computing power, and we're not investing in research and development, maybe we're, bringing, maybe we're buying in the talent that's going to drive innovation. Oh, wrong. We fell from uh, 7th in 2006 at investing in talent. It's all OEDC numbers, comparators, right? From 7th to 15th in this last report. So now that we're benchmarking over years, right? We've got eight years now of data within Canada. Right? We can compare ourselves, and we drop from 7th position in 2006 to 15th in 2012. We also looked at the funding environment. So you go, okay, well, maybe it's, frankly, maybe it's the government's fault that these companies aren't investing in either research or skilled workforces or ITC. Maybe we're doing something wrong on the public policy front. So we actually took a look at some of those things to try and, 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 and figure that out. And of course, firms are responsible for their decisions for growth and for being innovative. We, we all understand that. It's not the government's job, but it is the government's job, we keep hearing, uh, to create the economic environment where they can make those kind of decisions. In Canada, we do that in two ways. We do direct funding to support business, 
uh, and we do indirect support to business. Uh, right now, there's a major thing going on about investment in a company in the uh, in, in, in eastern part of Canada, right, which would be a direct support to business, right? But also, we have indirect support that goes through tax measures for all companies to compete for and win. So overall, when you compare ourselves to others around the world, government ranked 10th in government funding for business R&D. Okay, government's putting in, we're ranking 10th, but our R&D and our talent and our ITC is ranking where? Right? So we're not getting the juice back, are we, from those investments, right? So now we mine that a little bit deeper because there is direct and indirect support. And what we have done for the last decade particularly is invest heavily in indirect support. So th I'm not into politics, so, so don't, do anything I say is, is, is uh, a country boy from near Oshawa would say in his understanding of how public policy works. But we've had a government that says, if we get the economic floor right, then companies will flourish. So we're not going to directly subsidize or support them in R&D or help them hire PhD students, graduates. We're going to get the floor right. That's indirect support. And we've done that through something that's called shreds, and some of you will know about that. And, and they're, they help companies who invest in innovation because they give them a tax credit for doing that. On direct support, Canada was at 28%. Now, now you can think about how a political agenda drives something, right? So we're 10% overall, but on direct support, we're 20, that's a policy instrument they did. That, that's, it's not a political statement I'm making, it's a policy instrument. If we do indirect support, the rest will happen, right? And what we found was, in our work, that frankly the rest didn't happen. Okay, so we were very high in what we supported from an indirect point of view, very competitive. We ranked third in the world on indirect support for companies. And we didn't get the juice back. Okay, so then we looked at another thing, which was uh, uh, how firms introduced products into the marketplace that were new and innovative. I left my BlackBerry someplace. That was a very major uh, uh, innovation. It took 20 years to get it into the marketplace, and we've seen how all that's worked over the last 20 years. I was Deputy Minister of Innovation in Ontario when my minister came into my office and he said, I want you to make this work. And I said, Minister, what is it? <laughs> and he said, I just went to this company in Waterloo that's amazing. It's called RIM. And they gave me this device. And your job is to make it work. And so I go to our IT, IT guys in government and I say, we got to make this work. They say, what is it? Brand new in the year 1998, right? So that's how quickly things have changed in the development of new products into the system, right? But when we look at our companies in Canada, we actually haven't done that well at introducing new products over the time period that we're studying and reporting on today. But small, medium-sized companies have done much better than large companies. So all this interest that you see in the papers and read and, and, and get on the internet and find out that governments should be investing in SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises, is because they're actually bringing new products to market, not the large cap companies bringing new products to market. And so how do we actually nurture that and help those small, medium-sized companies? In the year 1998, RIM was one. How do you help nurture them to become major companies within the Canadian ecosystem to help drive our success? And that becomes something that, that we need, the, the, the government policymakers need to continue to do. All right, so I got some data around that. If, I don't know if I, well, I should, eh? Because this is a data meeting. Uh, yeah, SMEs rank fourth and large caps rank 19th. That's the data points on those. And, in case you wonder if we actually did that homework. Okay, so now we're going to switch horses for a little bit and study another component where we as Canadians can measure our own success in a competitive world, and that is how are we doing on the knowledge side of the equation? So demand pull and supply push, how are we doing in that sort of world? And we took a deep dive in that 
and, uh, uh, and came back with some thoughts and some recommendations on how we can do better. So we do pretty well in, on high knowledge. I mentioned that when I did the first summary, right, of our recommendations. The question is, are they getting absorbed into the workplace? And some of you who have a basement full of graduates <laughs> will know that it's a challenge right now to get them jobs, right? And it is a challenge, and our data, of course, supports what your basement already knows, <laughs> right? Which is that it's hard to find jobs for people. And it's hard to interpret a bit. I'm going to do another rim one because I'm a real big fan of Mike Lazaridis, who taught me a lot back when I was doing that at the provincial level in the, around the year 2000. And Mike said, it's, I don't need the ideas coming out of the research labs. We keep on pushing that we need to invent things and we need to do all those things. What I need is the ability in the graduates' minds. And he said, the, what's going to help us as a country develop is walking across the campus in sneakers, not in intellectual property that's being put together. The private sector can do that secondary part. That was one idea. You may have different. I want to get into a conversation with you when we get finished this presentation. So we examined how we're doing on R&D, and there were four different areas that we looked at. The quality of knowledge produced, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The level of investment in R&D, both across the economy and more specifically in higher education institutions. The effectiveness of these instruments at building critical mass and research areas, and the extent to which knowledge is transferred between science and innovation players. So how does it get transferred? Those are the areas that we looked at. And the conclusion of this component, and then I'll explain it, was that Canada maintains its solid performance on knowledge quality, but lost ground to competitors on the investment in R&D. Needs to be explained, because Jim Flaherty, when he was Minister of Finance and a huge innovation minister in Canada, said we have invested in more in research over the last, how, how long they were in power? Eight or 10 years, right? And he was right. He was right, only everybody else spent more than we did. So then a new minister, Minister Duncan, who's great, great young lady doing the science portfolio, says, well, we're not competing with others. And she's also right. Okay, So we have spent a lot of money on research, but others are spending more. I'll give you some data points to support that. But when it comes to the quality, this one actually I was ama amazed me when I, when I looked at, at, the, uh, at the draft report. We have 96 researchers who rank among the top 1% of the most cited researchers in the world in their respective fields. So cited, to those of you who aren't in the academic world, if somebody looks up, they've, they've done some work or they're doing some work here, and they say, well, who's done work that I can build on? And I will cite them for that work. Right? So then you go back in through other experiments, you say, oh, there's one. That makes, now they have to cite so that the previous researcher gets credit. That's called a citation. And the citation, we have 96 scientists in Canada that are in the top 1% of the world. I think that's an attaboy. Like, I really think that's an attaboy. And it speaks not only to our scientists' abilities, but also government over time's ability to continue to fund them so that they can be absolutely top of their game. 1% in the world, 96 scientists, right? You guys, some of you will know some of them. So that's a really important measurement to have. Uh, we have a lot of star power. We rank actually with universities very competitively. We have two, uh, McGill and Toronto, who rank very highly in the world setting. University of British Columbia is also very close to that, right? So ranking-wise, when universities are compared for all the various things they do at ODDC, right, we rank very highly with some of our major institutions. We should give another attaboy to ourselves. We then looked at the investment in R&D, and we found out, as I've already said, that it's, it can be interpreted, right? Uh, I should give you the data point, so just for those of you who you want to know these. Um, so our total investments in R&D remained essentially unchanged over the last eight years. Minister Flaherty was right. I've invested the same as we did the year before. We have not cut research in Canada. Right? However, the other countries uh, increased their investments. 
So Canada's global ranking, this is where Minister Duncan can now say, our global ranking on, uh, uh, on investment uh, as a percentage of GDP fell from uh, 16th to 24th. So here's a country, Canada, continuing to invest as we have, but falling from 16th to 24 over an eight-year period. What's going on in the world? People understand that science and technology are going to drive their success as a jurisdiction, and they're pumping it. And we either better figure that out and pump more, or we better find a different way to build our economy. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, I thought so. All right. Uh, so I don't need to do that part. That's okay. All right, so on talent, uh, we've already talked about that a little bit. Um, I'm not going to do that uh, page mostly. I'm going to do an interesting thing, though. Canada's talent base continues to be an asset, but performance is showing, the report says, mild signs of erosion. It's the same argument that we used around research spending. Others are doing more. Here's an interesting little factoid that's not in the report. I have a friend whose name is Bonnie Schmidt, who runs an organization called Let's Talk Science, and it's along with the Learning Partnership. How long do you work with? They try to get kids interested in careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. She did a piece of work with a woman, that, a professor that was over here from China on sabbatical. And in China, they no longer do STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, as a driver. Because over 50% of their undergraduates, people graduating with four-year degrees, are graduating with engineering degrees. Ho, ho! Wow. Half their graduates are graduating with engineering degrees. So they're no longer talking about STEM. They're talking about STEM, science, technology, agriculture, and math because they want to figure out a way that they can feed their own population. So I'm a farm boy. Here we are sending all sorts of trade business to China, thinking our future is in exporting product to them. And I'm going, wait a minute here. They're going to figure this out because they don't need engineers. They need agricultural people to grow their own food in safe growing conditions, which they've got their struggles. Right? Fascinating how that economy is changing. And so we're comparing ourselves then with that when we say we're marginally slipping on the talent side. Okay, so, well, surely then, it must be that we're not training our people with the right things to get the jobs. It could be that that's the case. I, by the way, in that last point, in case you want data points for it, we've moved from 17th to 19th over the over the six-year period. So we're not bad, right, but on, on the graduating people, not PhDs, but others uh, with science technology. And then we go to our college system, and we've seen a decline of a third in the STEM areas in college participation right now. And frankly, that blows me away, because a lot of kids I know work on our farm and other places that I know uh, are saying we got to get a university degree, then we got to go to college and get some skills to actually apply for a job. Right? But we're seeing that actually a third are not going into the science, technology, engineering, and math areas in the last study that we have done here. I find that fascinating, right? So I'm not sure what they're studying because we didn't actually mine that any deeper, but uh, uh, somebody should. I'm on the next page. Okay, so what about uh, the younger kids? I made, uh, gave credit to a couple of different organizations who work with kids. We're actually at the, the you, you know, they, they uh, compare 15-year-olds around the world. We're doing pretty well in, in, those, in those studies. Uh, in fact, we're among the top performers in, uh, in reading, mathematics, and science. We're, we're not the very top, but we're, we're doing okay on the education front. Uh, which helps feed that, that whole system, right? Okay, enough of that. So then you, when I summarize that sort of chapter in the report, you go, okay, so we did business, now we've done education and research, we're doing okay, we're not quite keeping up with others, uh, we're not failing, uh, we're graduating some talented people, we've got scientists that are really, graduate, or really top of their game, 96 of them in the top 1%, uh, gave ourselves an attaboy. That's sort of the science component of the report 
that we have published. Well, then how are we going to get these two things put together? That becomes our challenge, right? And that becomes our challenge. And that's where we need input from everybody in this room as to how would you do that? But that's going to come later in our program uh, today. So we need to close the gap. This is sort of where we come back to our final again. We need to close the gap on the, uh, on the major companies and how they're investing in R&D. We need to try and understand why it is that they're not. Some argue it's because we're branch plant here, the big companies. So General Motors doing lots of work in, uh, in research. They're, they're just not doing it at Oshawa. Uh, you know, and you can just count a number. That's, I do that one because it's right handy to us here, although they are doing work on the autonomous car at Oshawa. So, you know, what is it that's going to change this so that we can do, is it direct support that they need from, from government? And all of those things are policy things that need to, to be uh, explored. And where government can probably play a real important role is in the area of procurement. So, yes, we've got trade agreements with all sorts of things around what we can and can't buy and how we do it and compete. But the United States have a program where they can help companies with high-risk enterprises to get them in, into government-procured labs. I'll give an example. This was a great guy. He died, uh, he died with cancer, died very young. His company is ATS, and when you drive along 401 at Kitchener, you see them just on the north side, just right by Highway 8. Great company, solar panels. And when I was in the provincial government, he came to me as deputy minister of energy, and he said, I want to give you solar panels if you will put them on a government building. I said, wow, I don't know how we could do that because we have procurement policies in place so we can't accept gifts, blah, blah, blah. I went on like a bureaucrat would, <laughs> right? And, and you go, he said, I pick people up at the airport to come out to see our plant, to see the very innovative process we're doing around solar panels. And the first question they ask me is, has your government put any on their buildings? Well, procurement is a huge area that we can help on the innovation. That's a story that I probably shouldn't tell on the TV screen because it could be a, a, a poor close died with cancer. But the company c continues, and I suspect even now we wouldn't know how to put those solar panels on one of the government buildings because it wouldn't follow some rules that we create for ourselves. As a society, we create these rules, right? Because we want to be fair to everybody, right? Which inhibits some of this procurement issues. And that's something that the government could take a look at, and we recommend that they do so, right? So that's one of the things that we recommended. Uh, we, we recommended that we work with industries and academics to make sure that we're graduating the skills that they want. So we're graduating great, but they're not getting hired. Is it, a, is it the problem that we're not getting the skills that they need to drive their economy, or is there some other barrier? And, and the one that we use is PhDs hired, because that's a piece, piece of data. And, and for those of you who, who, who didn't go to university, I spent all day yesterday with my Amish friend at Milverton, Ontario, who has created a natural food product. He has grade eight, and he is doing outstanding work when it comes to natural remedies for animal feeds, right? I get it. But what we studied in the report was the absorption of PhDs because it's a readily available number and we think that PhDs coming into a company should help because they will be more interested in research and innovation than otherwise. So are we graduating the right skills and we need to actually have a, a systems-wide approach between academic pushers and the absorbers of those people uh, with, uh, through our companies? And that's something that we can certainly do and something that we uh, recommended quite highly in our, in our report. The other thing that we recommended in the report was doing the same things as we've done isn't going to work because it isn't working. So just to keep rolling it along isn't going to work. So we need a fresh new approach as to how to get more innovation in our companies and in our society. Is that each of us taking more risk on as citizenry, saying, well, we want to buy an invention from Canada, we're not going to buy an invention from someplace else. How do those kinds of things feed into this? How do we get our companies to produce the kind of innovative products that we want to do? What we know is the same old will not get us the success that we in Canadians believe we want. 
And we think that the way to do that, and Minister Duncan and Minister Baines are particularly well positioned. Now two ministers of science, we've never actually had a minister of science in Canada before. Now we have two with science in their name. They're well positioned to actually create a different approach, working with the total industry and small business as well. There's three components to this, right? And through that process, we think that we can come back with a different model that would, uh, would make Canada competitive. It is 20 to 3. I would like to end there so that we can have some questions from the audience, if there are any. Thank you.